pleasure to wish it is to meet you. <laughs> his heart, his heart is in the same place as ours. Jim's buyer, but uh, Jim spent 39 years uh, in the International Building Materials Group in, in Ireland. He joined as an electrical engineer. I've got an elder son who's an electrical engineer. Uh, ended up being group and technical advisor for the latter half of 19 years, reporting to the CEO. In his, in his role, he pioneered best practice knowledge sharing across all group activities in 34 countries, spearheaded the group's highly recognised corporate social responsibility program. <laughs> As a retirement hobby, I don't know whether you find time for a retirement <laughs> hobby, Jim. <laughs> Jim analyses the su sustainability performance of all major cement companies each year. Shared objective climate science. And it was, it was from this conviction that the European Declaration came to be. To his pleasant surprise, Jim was recently accepted as an independent expert reviewer by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, in the drafting of its sixth coming assessment report. Jim much appreciates the opportunity to meet up and share experiences with climate realists in Australia. Hey. Over to you, Jim. Thank you for such a wonderful welcome. I never dreamt in my life that I would meet such good friends in Australia and that the, uh, it would be about climate realism. Um, I have a presentation which I'll run through quickly and then maybe we'll open it up to Q&A because you can really get a, a, a much more interesting discussion going at that stage. So I'll begin my presentation uh, which is all about, first of all, thank you for the welcome, uh, talking a little bit how we came to form uh, a climate realist group in Ireland, just as one example, and how we look at the science and how we've uh, set up about communicating our message and then broadening out into talking about more cooperation at a global level. And I think the, the little picture tells you the story of where, where the alarmists are saying all jumping over the cliff face and this us are the people asking the question, are we really right the way everything is going? Um, I picked, uh, quite accidentally came into the area of climate science uh, when I was uh, in uh, working in CRH, uh, the, com the building materials company, I was asked to do a report for the board on what the implications of climate change would be for that company. Um, so that was back 10 more years ago. And even beginning uh, to look into that, it very quickly became apparent that there was more than the IPCC story that if anybody really began to sit down and look and read alternative viewpoints, that there were a whole lot of holes in the IPCC story and that there were a whole lot of other facts that weren't being uh, taken into account. So um, I, uh, again, having worked on that and you know received all the messages every day on the newsletters, um, I became concerned that in Ireland in particular, the Irish government was really heading down the IPCC road in its preparations for what was then the COP leading up to the Paris Agreement. So I prepared a paper um, which tried to summarise the, um, the arguments to and fro, and I'll, you can pass it around the audience, um, summarising both the IPCC story and the alternative, the solar and other prospects. So that uh, I brought into the Irish Academy of Engineering and there was rather vested interest very becoming very apparent there in renewables and things like that. So um, I decided that we really needed to d uh, form a little group of our own of independent climate realists. So I got together with one or two others. We formed the Irish Climate Science Forum. Um, it wasn't easy. Some people came and they had slightly different viewpoints and they want to do things a different way. But we formed the Irish Climate Science Forum and we've slowly moved forward from there and we've begun, we decided that we really should bring the best science available uh, into Ireland. 
So we set up a series of lectures um, using and bringing, inviting in the world's top independent scientists. So that led forward and uh, we developed um, a more precise document trying to summarize the, the arguments uh, of the, the real, the climate science, you know, the fact that um, the, the models in IPCC are well overheated, that, you know, the basic things about the Arctic is not disappearing, uh, the Antarctic is, is certainly very solid and Greenland, plus a whole lot of other facts and brought them together so we could try to start to, to lobby our government people. And we made various submissions and um, they were totally ignored. We just got a response, we got your document, but absolutely no dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, we set up these lectures inviting in people, I'll run through them in a moment, very high flyers. But, and we invited the people from the government, from the Environmental Protection Agency, from other bodies, the Climate Change Advisory Council to the government. Would they turn up? No. You know, there's a complete, much more than, Australia, there is a relatively good open debate, actually, compared to Ireland. <laughs> well, that's got you going. <laughs> Why don't you show us? Well, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, and it, believe it or not, for example, when we started to organize our lectures, we looked to various, uh, even the engineering institution, they, they wouldn't host our lecture. You know, it, it was that bad. We had to uh, host our lectures in a hotel. Well, uh, we could have used a golf club, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But um, for convenience, we used a hotel. And that just shows you how anti, the, closed the minds are of the government people and they just did not wish to hear anything about an alternative viewpoint. And there's so much vested interest and the newspapers absolutely wouldn't even entertain a letter written questioning some of their, and they, of course they have articles every day of the week on the alarmist side. So it's, it's but we've uh, formed our climate science group, we have our lectures, the word is gradually getting out that there is an alternative view on the science and people are now finding us on the internet under the icsf.ie and they're beginning to be much, much more open. Uh, then, yes, uh, we started to establish links with other similar minded bodies in Europe. Of course, at the top left, the Global Warming Policy Foundation in London. Then there's a Dutch Climate Gate NL, they call themselves. Uh, there's a, a quite a strong group in France, they call themselves Climate Realists, and they actually have quite an open debate and do programs on, have been interviewed on television. They, they've made very good progress. Uh, then there's IK, the German group. Um, they also are very strong and, and work with various political parties. There's a Belgian group. And on the right-hand side, there's a Danish group, a Swedish group, and a Norwegian group. So the, the, we're really beginning to interconnect, which is very valuable at a, at a European level, because in the Irish context, we were, we were picked off and very viciously attacked, some of our people, very viciously attacked. And even some articles, sl very slanderous articles, were written, and the, the authors try, went to the press um, ombudsman, to, to get a fair hearing, but even the ombudsman wouldn't hear the story. It's extraordinarily closed. At the top right, uh, we're forming through that a European Climate Realists uh, Network, and that's where this European declaration originated. You know, the lecturers we had, for example, Dick Linson, he's, uh, you all know it's a household name, he is really the grandfather of climate sci realist climate science. Uh, he's uh, uh, Alfred Sloan, professor of MIT, now retired emeritus. Uh, but we had him as our first lecturer, and he, you know, brought us through the basics on the, on the bottom right there. That uh, pal uh, the paleoclimate tells us that there was absolutely no link between the global temperatures and carbon dioxide levels. They were all over the place. If anything, carbon dioxide followed temperature changes rather than leading them. And he. Um, you know, looking at that may be rather complicated, but that's, that's the, the various uh, prevailing estimates of um, uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity. 
and Richard Linson was one of the ones who first, through his work, came to find that real climate uh, sensitivity is only about one degree. He's and got a real hockey stick. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another guy called Ray Bates, who is part of our group in Ireland. He's a retired professor of meteorology, a, a great climate scientist, but he also came to the conclusion that was about one degree. And you know the rest of the story, they're all the IPCC. Despite having spent $40 billion in research, have not yet narrowed their range of sensitivity. So, you know, that's, that's uh, scandalous, really. The, did I skip one there? I don't think so. Uh, the next uh, uh, person we had was Will Happer of, um, of Princeton. Uh, the little group there on the, on the left is inter uh, on the top right. Uh, there's Ray Bates is the first person, then Will Happer. He's a lovely guy. He's really very uh, relaxed. And, and he was actually advisor uh, up to recently to President Trump in the White House. Um, so he was giving really good advice, I can assure you. And then there's me, and the three people at the back are the Connolly brothers, or the Connolly family, actually. And they have done great research. Um, they're completely independent Irish uh, scientists, and they have done a lot of very good research. That, I mean, one of them is a school teacher. They're, they're, not, they're well qualified, but uh, they do brilliant research. And uh, one of their papers, for example, is that they, having dis recently got a whole lot of Russian temperature data released after the Cold War, they actually were able to deduce that there was an Arctic melt in the 1930s, as, uh, you know, just as, as now, and, and that had built up since again. And they've done work, for example, on Chinese temperature data that shows that when you really boil down and look for um, temperature sets that are not affected by urban heat island, there's hardly any temperature rise, maybe half a degree in the last 150 years. And they've now done some work, which I, I haven't studied, but they believe that there's possibly no, absolutely no greenhouse gas effect at all. So, interesting stuff. Anyhow, Bill ha Will Happer is very much on the, the decreasing effect of CO2 because it's logarithmic, so doubling it actually is, keeps on reducing and reducing. And he's very much focused on agricultural emissions, uh, emissions. In other words, that the methane and nitrous oxide are already blocked out by water vapor and, and other. Uh, so there's, which is, that's particularly important for Ireland because 33% of our emissions are agricultural. And I was talking to the guys in New Zealand where they're showing in particular that for methane and nitrous oxide, the effect of doubling those is actually negligible, negligible in the whole uh, picture of, of global warming potential. So, and that, that will be dramatic and it really is important for the, the agricultural sector. Um, and they, they, they have done great work and that is shortly to be published. Then we had, we took a look at the solar side and we had Henrik Svensmark of, of the Danish University. And you know, he's done his, his pioneering work is on the relationship between cosmic rays and, and temperature. And uh, because of the link between sunspots uh, cosmic rays being deflected or not, the formation of clouds, and the effect thereby on, on uh, global temperature, which is explaining how uh, changes in, in, in sunspots can have a big amplifying effect on global temperature. So by, by tracing, as he did, uh, cosmic ray trends through the, over the last thousand years, he was able to replicate the temperature changes right through the uh, Little Ice Age and, and the other periods. So that, that is pioneering work that can show uh, that there is a very much different explanation that can really explain an awful lot and maybe everything. Yeah. Uh, so um, he, <laughs> he ran into quite a, some difficulty in his, but he really persisted. Uh, his difficulty was demonstrating that the uh, cosmic rays could lead to cloud formation. But he's come through that and his work is certainly very, very sound. Then comp very complementary to him is Nir Shaviv, the Israeli. Um, he's done brilliant work. And, and uh, from the bottom diagrams, you can see he's really gone back through the Earth's evolution 
to trace the, the, um, the link between cosmic rays and global temperatures and, and climate change over, over millennia. And, um, you know, when, when again, when y you take in the top right graph, uh, um, superimpose what he can explain in terms of global temperatures going forward, the, the you know, the sort of, even if whatever um, greenhouse gas effect there is, could lead to a maximum rise of about one degree per se. So it really is putting a different perspective on the whole thing. It's not at all just about CO2. There are a whole lot of other things going on. And then we had a guy, Nicola Scafeta, he's in the middle of that picture, a, an Italian guy, very, very, very uh, animated. And in that picture actually is, is a group where, where we brought together several of the European groups. On the left, you have Benny Pizer of the UK, London, Global Warming. Uh, the second is Wolfgang Müller, who is uh, par very much part of the German Association. Uh, in the middle is Nicolas Cafeta, me, and then you have uh, Benoit Rito on the right of the French Association. They're all very friendly, you can see, putting the arm around and all the rest. Uh, but they're a great group of people and, and, and very, very focused. And bright. And bright, yes, very bright, yeah. And, um, you know, Nicolas Cafeta took things uh, by looking at the, all the trends in... Um, the, in temperature variation and relating it to solar cycles and other planetary motion um, deduced, you know, that he can, through that process, you can explain an awful lot of the recent uh, global warming, very specifically in terms of particular cycles of the moon and other planets. So it again puts a completely different picture on the, the whole climate scene. And again, looking at when he put his picture in that and projecting that these conti will continue forward in the future, again, it shows that he, in his view, you cannot have more than one degree of CO2 related or greenhouse gas related uh, climate change. So all of those pictures and all of those scientists from quite different viewpoints show very much that CO2, it's not just CO2, that there are other things in play and that CO2 is, is, relative, is very mu much minor than IPCC says. And that is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. Then we had Pat Michaels of the Cato Institute. He's very much a lukewarmer, as you might guess from the title. But again, it's the same thing. That, you know, the, the, there is, we would accept overall, a small greenhouse gas effect, but much, much lower than what IPCC are saying. Yeah, exactly, and, and equally that warmth benefits the planet and, and that the CO2 benefits the planet. And, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, he, you know, puts the social car car cost of carbon actually at negative rather than a, a, very, positive, a very positive figure. So, you know, the, all of those things in this classical graph again shows how much the actual global temperatures as measured by balloons and satellite, are lying well below the IPCC AR5 models. And in fact, there's only one model, it's a single line at the bottom, a Russian model that is getting things about right. So it just shows, and that curve is widening, it's already more than half a degree, and, and is really just showing that IPCC models are totally wrong. And you know, there's more and more uh, papers that have come out that shows the IPC model is quite arbitrary in fact. It's just, you know, th there is no foundation to it. <laughs> You're an easy Aussie, Aussie audience to talk to. Uh, then we had John Christie, he's the famous guy of, of the, 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 again, of this curve which he presented to the US Congress showing how the actual temperatures are way, way below what the IPC projections are. And equally in terms of the troposphere, having measured, uh, there's simply the hot spot predicted by the IPCC models mm -hmm. doesn't at all exist. And equally, you know, if you um, uh, were to s suddenly stop, however, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that it would have practically zero effect on, on global temperatures. And equally that all of the predictions of doom and gloom of the last 20 years or more have never, none have proven to be actually real. Just looking at some kind of broader th things about extreme events and, and taking Greenland as one example because it's so much talked about. 
and this the top curve is the through the year the the uh, incremental gain and loss of of snow and ice mass you know at times during the winter it's been much colder than normal and and they that they all say oh that's the weather but then in july august there was this supposedly big melt and they said oh it's climate change yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, all weather. it's always that they say in there wouldn't they um, but again, you know, they talk of maybe of a billion tons melt, but that's point zero 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 something of 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 the total ice mass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you know, again, looking at this year's figure, the blue line, it's well within the the typical average. So certainly Greenland is not melting. And on the right hand side is a kind of a ten thousand year uh, time scale of the Greenland ice mass ice mast mass. And again, it's varied up and down, and certainly what modern day stuff is, is, is absolutely nothing exceptional. And again, looking at the Arctic, you know, the, the, the temperature changes. If you go back to the 1930s, there were warm periods in the Arctic as well, which correspond to the dust bowl in the US. And equally, the, whole, the Antarctic, while cooling, has had a recent little bump, but I mean, that's nothing in the context of the past. And, you know, the uh, people talk about sea level rise, but again, the simple fact is the top right that is uh, measured according to satellite is just over three millimeters a year. <laughs> so, I mean, by 2100, maybe t another 25 centimeters. So, you know, that's no emergency. There is no emergency. That's that's simple fact. OK, over very long time scales, there have been major sea level changes but certainly not in modern times, and that, that is, you know, uh, I, and I think that sea level thing of just 25 centimeter is something that you can really put out to the politicians because it's, it's, it's so simple, it's so small, it, it simply says very clearly that there is no climate emergency. And equally, if you look at the temperatures and project forward from the, the, the slope of the actual measurements, you get about 0.1 of a degree per decade so by 2100, maybe you certainly have less than one degree extra. So I think that is a particularly two particularly important points to make to the politicians that look, the facts are telling us that at most we'll have one degree, probably less, by 2100, and 25 centimeter sea level rise. So what's the emergency? Let's, let's do things, let's spend our money properly rather than spending it on, on crazy projects. Yeah, and actually the, 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 the actual datum uh, uh, data, if you analyze that, it comes to down to about one millimeter per year. And I don't know how, I can't explain the difference between the satellite figure and the... Well, we found in Ireland in particular, it appears that the datum points are, are sinking. Well, because, because they're building so much near them. Yeah, or abstra abstra abstracting water that the actual uh, level is, is sinking and that's thereby producing an apparent sea level rise. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but again, looking at, you know, temperature data over, over the, the last, since the, 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 the last um, ice age, you know, there have been the warm periods, the, the medieval warming, which they are trying very hard to delete, and the Roman warming period and the Minoan warming period. And you know temperatures were considerably higher than now, so it's um, it's really you know that those data tell you very simply there is no emergency. We're we're in fact we're we're blooming lucky to be in the the climate we have now. It could have been it was much colder over the the the, the little ice age. And again, at the top right are the over the last uh, four interglacials. Uh, we're at a happy point now of, of having good temperature. It was slightly higher at various points, but let's enjoy it before the next ice yeah, age exactly. comes. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the one reason for conserving fuel resources, actually. We'll need them very badly in the, in the next ice age. So again, looking at the solar picture, uh, there, there are a lot of people that say, you know, the, 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 the sunspot trends and changes and the solar cycles there are many that postulate that cycle 25 may lead to a cooling, a very significant cooling in the next decade or two. So we'll see how it works out. And you know, looking at other things like the top left are the European um, 
uh, fire uh, outbreaks, and you know there was a it's a declining trend overall. And looking at Brazil on the top right, you know, so much all over the news of the br fires in Brazil. But they're nothing compared with what they were a decade ago. You know, that those basic facts don't, don't come through. And then in looking at global fire levels, there's also a, a declining trend. Despite what you see, see the anthropogenic effect is video cameras all over the place and immediately going online and on the news headlines. For Australia, I'd love to see more a trend. You know, you see it on, I saw it on the television this morning in the fires and so on. But it would be great to have more extended data so you can say, is, is it getting more or is it less than it was? And, you know, it, it's important that you kind of can establish that data more firmly. It's on the Bureau of Meteorology site. Okay, good. And is it declining uh, or going up? Okay, well that's so interesting got, in itself. They've got from uh, 1918 to 2019. Okay, okay. So, so they got 101 years worth of data. Okay, but, and the other factor incidentally in all of that is that with the increased, slightly increased CO2 level, there is more uh, photosynthesis and more stuff to burn. Mm -hmm. So that's the effect that, that has to be taken into account. Um, and looking again at the number of tornadoes in the US, actually declining trend. On the top right, the number of Category 5 hurricanes in the Atlantic. Okay, uh, the Bahamas was really a tragedy, but it's nothing new. When you go back, it's all there. And, but of course, they, the media tell you, this is unprecedented. That's their favorite word. And similarly, the, um, the, the droughts in the US, you know, back big peaks in the 1930s, the 1950s. And if you look at rainfall, just the example of Ireland, it's been up and down all over the place. And despite being the reputation of a rain, every, there have been huge droughts in the past. So weather is, is very variable and, and uh, don't rush to any conclusions. That one uh, is of interest. Uh, maybe you know more about it than I, but it's the, the coral bleaching over 400 years. And it's shown to be greater in 1790 and 1850. So I mean, that uh, that that is really important stuff, uh, and you know we get all the stuff and the Peter Ridd's sad story about the you know supposed destruction of the, of the coral uh, through bleaching, but so it's important to establish facts on what really has happened and and this show that there's nothing unprecedented. Uh, temperature measurements uh, at the top left. You know the story of the, the um, I believe, more and more UHI effect, the, the urban heat island effect. There are so many temperature um, measurement pl places that are now situated at airports or whatever, and they're being surrounded by buildings, and there's a completely artificial picture emerging of, of temperatures rising simply because where they're located. Whereas, and there's probably nearly, certainly more than half a degree, maybe even a degree in average, uh, and uh, so it's really important, and I think more research needs to be done on that, and perhaps even in Australia, uh, to, to determine where your measurement points are and to really even photograph them so you can build up a picture of is, are these temperatures real or not. And when you look at the, the news this morning, you see the top of Australia and the b burning ember diagrams and heat and heat and heat. But they're showing very hot temperatures in places where there are no temperature measurements, and I'm sure, right in the middle of the country. They just make it up. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. you know, that comes back. You've got to have facts. And I, I think here in Australia, you can help us greatly. I, I'm talking in the global sense by the more information you can gather on that kind of thing. Two years ago, they closed down the coldest weathering station in Australia at yeah. Charles Park. They yeah, closed yeah. it down. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the problem. And so, some other countries are, I believe in Canada, actually destroying old temperature records, which is criminal. Um, you see, when it comes between facts and religion, religion always wins out. <laughs> you, you could do the lecture for me here. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, the top right, Australia there, the, the, the temperature data, and that really comes back. Is Australia really getting hotter? Uh, well, <laughs> get the facts, please. <laughs> and, you know, the, the um, satellite data, which we all, every month, monitor, 
and again it shows the ups and downs but actually the the planet is cooling since the last uh, uh, El Nino in 2015-16 mm -hmm. and uh, you know just taking uh, temperatures for you know any country over any period they really are moving at n n not at all if you can see the data. So coming back um, we uh, in, in linking up with the European associations we started saying well we really need to get our act together as a group so um, we decided we'd write a what we call a European declaration and that would be that we'd get a very basic statement uh, if you can read it on the right climate change is is happening but it's not much less than IPCC predicts uh, CO2 is the basis of life and the um, there is no actually no increase in natural disasters it's it, the, the, the records are there which show if you go through them uh, carefully things just happen in the past so we developed this uh, simple one letter climate uh, declaration and it was originally intended to go to, go to European politicians but because of the urgency of, of uh, the Guterres summit recently we decided we'd send the first edition to him and um, so at that stage we have developed um, we've got over 500 signatures from 13 countries 15 countries already and it's extending by the day literally but it is a, a very good initiative to say that there is no climate emergency because uh, you know the facts are that's what the facts are saying and um, that uh, will be going to the European politicians we have a conference in Oslo in about two weeks time and we will be re refining that and bringing it together and then sending it to the European politicians but it's hugely valuable to us that we now have signatures from Australia from New Zealand uh, we, uh, we have them from Latin America from the United States from Canada and of course practically every country in Europe um, and that you know is really uh, of course the alarmists are saying well who are these guys and they don't know anything but you know it is a tremendously important gathering of, of forces together because up to now in each country they picked us off as being the lunatics if you like as being the so now we're gathering together and hugely valued and that's why I hugely value being here uh, connecting directly with people in Australia climate realists and uh, we intend to uh, launch it to, to European politicians in a couple of weeks time because the the new European Commission uh, is elected and takes office on the 1st of November and then we're planning a global release in uh, November uh, through press conference in Brussels in advance of the COP25 in Chile so it's really rolling forward and I think it's a very powerful statement uh, we've already been heavily criticized but <laughs> we're also going to simply get the facts together uh, about what is really happening um, just looking at, at you guys and your, your national energy uh, policy yeah that's uh, admire all you're doing um, exiting the Paris Accord that's up to you guys um, uh, I'm sure the people in this room would certainly vote that way um, I think as I had said it's important that you get as much data uh, on what things happening in Australia that you can because it's very important not just for Australia but everywhere that we can say and that you can prove and that you know if you can prove for your temperature data that is biased or whatever you can get that published not not by peer review but by in the likes of, of Benny Pizer's um, network his newsletters he would published that thing and that goes global so it's really important to get the facts out we need more and more facts and you know uh, somebody winced when I said I, I put myself forward we have to try and influence IPCC from the inside as well as from the outside and that's why believe it or not I signed up as chair of the Irish Climate Science Forum to become an IPCC independent reviewer and to my surprise they accepted it so I've made pretty stinging comments on the first order draft of oh, AR6 <laughs> <laughs> as have many others you know and uh, I, I hope you guys some of you guys might actually think of the same thing because you can fight them from inside as well they may and probably will reject any comments 
but at least it, it's, it gives you more ammunition afterwards if they say they haven't, if it shows that they haven't listened to them. And, um, you know, it also gives you a, an early uh, insight into what they're thinking of in, in AR6. And I mean, guess what? Solar is a half page just dismissed. Oh, yeah and uh, they're developing what they call CMI6 models, which are still more uh, blown up in terms of future uh, temperatures and so on. It's, it's quite incredible. They, they just have, but I hope that by this um, uh, climate initiative and just getting so many different people and getting the message out there, there is an alternative view. I hope that will bring IPCC to its senses, that they can't get away with this bluff any longer. Uh, that the truth has to emerge. And that really is the very, very important uh, thing to, that, that we're all about. And I think that, you know, I, I'm optimistic that in the next, within the next five years, that is within the AR6 cycle, that the IPCC House of Cards will be severely challenged and will collapse simply due to lack of, of um, substance in their models. And they have to start getting realistic. There's no transparency in the there's no transparency, no. Right. It's completely yeah. opaque. Yeah. Well, that's a massive red flag, and it wasn't addressed in AR5. They're mm -hmm. going to have a go at it in AR6, yep. and that's where you can come in. Yep. Okay. Well, well, I'm, I'm just okay. nearly there anyway, because um, distribution and so on. And the other factor at the bottom right is the, is the, global, is the urbanization, mm -hmm. that the bigger cities are getting bigger and bigger, just as, as Sydney here, I'm sure that there, there's, and, and when you travel throughout Asia, you see the size of cities, where there are cities with a greater population that, than that of all of Australia. And that presents huge problems in terms of infrastructure and just so people can live decently. So I think those are the real challenges, global population growth, urbanization, water scarcity, food distribution, migration, and maybe coming into the next ice age. So that was a summary of life as I see it. I'm delighted to be here. And maybe an example of sustainable transport. <laughs> and I, I, on looking clo more closely at that picture, I just realized that it was a steam engine. So <laughs> good old fossil fuel. But on that, you could get more than your trousers singed. <laughs>
pure and simple. They need the money that that earns them to pay their bills and educate their children and make their investments and make their way in the world. Um, I am different from most of those people because I don't seriously do not need to be here for the money. Um, I've got plenty of money. Um, what they pay me to be is a politician. <laughs> no, no, I am dead serious when I say this to you. When, it, when the money they pay me as a politician, I do not need that as a job. I can go home and earn a lot more money. Um, so the problem is with most politicians is, is that they up upset the boat, they rock the boat, they create a problem, they risk losing their job, they risk losing their position. And that influences their decision making process. And that's it in a nutshell. That's what I have observed in two years in the job. Uh, so I've, I've, I've been having a lot of conversations with friends of mine who follow the climate science uh, and they adopt the so-called you know, so consensus view. Um, and I linked one of them recently, that paper showing that of the 32 models collated by the IPCC, only the one from uh, Richard Lindzen had accurately predicted the way the temperatures would go. And he said, oh great, uh, look, that, it says that, but I can link you 10 papers saying that the IPCC has generally gotten it correct. So what I'm wondering is what sort of flaws in either the way the data is collected or the methodology or the way they're drawing inferences can I, should I be looking out for? when someone sends me some of this research? Um, yeah, you have to, yeah, you see the, the, the whole IPCC consensus and establishment, call it that, they are very clever at sticking together. And they will sort of continue to propagate their story uh, until literally the world starts cooling. So I think uh, that's why uh, in this European declaration and in a wider global declaration, uh, declaration, it is important to show that there are a heck of a lot of scientists out there that have the alternative point of view and that we are saying as realists, we are willing to have a debate. Uh, the problem with uh, most of the consensus of the establishment is they do not wish to discuss anything because they're afraid to, I suspect. They, they have simply put their face in, in, the, in the model, the IPCC models, and are unwilling to sort of enter any kind of dialogue of our discussion. And I think the, the, our group, the column of the realists, have issued now that challenge. Look, let's have a debate. If, if, and, and, and that's very important to open up the topic. The, the guys who say that, they, they, those models outputs are submitted to them from different modeling groups around the world. And they quite candidly <coughs> say they didn't lay out by a report that they do not know how those results were obtained. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, don't yeah. know. So that's yeah. the answer, but they don't know either. It's, it, it, the, the models have been a black box. There have been a number of papers that have opened them up, opened up the black box and shown them.